You boys like Mexico? I don't know that I do, but uh, I will be going to Mexico uh, in like five hours. So there's that. Today is our first and probably only, uh, maybe not only, but one of our only uh, nighttime lectures, which I will be giving. Uh, I'm recording this on a Friday night, and you should have it uh, at the latest by Monday. But uh, let's get into the elements of poetry and sort of prepare ourselves for next week's, or for me it's next week. For you, it will be that week's forum discussion. What are the elements of poetry? Well, we'll start at the first and most obvious, which is structure. When we talk about structure, we're talking about the stanzas, so the organization that the poet uses to uh, put their poem together. Now, typically, and I'm not going to go through all of them, uh, when we look at stanzas, it depends on how many lines there are per stanza. Right? A stanza is, is sort of the main unit. Think of it as a paragraph for poetry. Uh, it's the main unit of construction. So sometimes there will be two, li you know, two lines in a stanza, Three lines, maybe one line, ten lines, it all depends. Uh, if you look at that Elements of Poetry uh, handout, you'll see all the different possibilities. Not all of them, but some of the different possibilities. Uh, and then their proper names. Now, why structure is important is because that organiza organization is unified by a particular principle. And that's a, a good place that you could start your analysis, right? And to sort of give an example, The Naked and the Nude by Robert Graves. Uh, when you read it, you'll notice that it's almost written like an essay. There's four stanzas, and you can look at the first stanza as the introduction. It's like an introduction of a good academic essay, right? It provides a thesis. That is to say there is an uh, argument that Graves gives in that first stanza, and he outlines what he's going to talk about, and gives you the argument that he's making. In line in stanzas two and three, we have sort of the argument, the main body, just like we do in an academic essay. And he outlines the differences between naked and nude, does a comparison and contrast. And in his final paragraph, or I'm sorry, his final stanza is just like the final paragraph of an essay, a conclusion. Right? It's the conclusion to his 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 poem and he answers that so what question. So structure is very important. There's a lot of different ways we can look at structure of a, uh, or structure of a poem and look at that organizing principle and get something out of it. The second element of poetry uh, that we'll often notice is the form. And form's a little tricky, right? This is something uh, we can t typically think about this in terms of lyric poetry, uh, odes, elegies, sonnets, Right there's a it sort of goes to that organizing principle, but it's also a part of sort of what makes that type of poem that type of poem. In a lyric poem, for example, there's a strong emphasis on thoughts and feelings and things like that. So knowing what type of poem you're reading, uh, either after you've read it or beforehand, uh, can be particularly beneficial, and we can use that again to sort of help us mine uh, that poem for analysis and interpretation. Maybe the, the poet uses the lyric form, but doesn't focus on feelings and emotions. Right? And maybe they're doing that for a specific reason. Uh, sometimes, like we talked about with Eliot, it's that, it's that subversion of the tradition, uh, that revolution against what is typical of that form or that uh, or our expectations. Another thing we notice in poetry, and probably the, the most obvious when it's read aloud, are sound patterns, right? Every poem, uh, or almost every poem, we could say, emphasizes the ear, the sound, the oral nature, the, the music of language. Now, when we talk about poetry, probably the two things that come up the most, uh, specifically with older poetry, is rhythm and meter. Now, the thing about rhythm and meter is not all poems have rhythm and meter. Uh, when we're talking about things like sonnets, uh, in Shakespeare's case, or um, in Naked in the Nude with Robert Graves, you do see that form, the, the sonnet form, and we see 
the typical meter, which is iambic pentameter. It's 10 syllables per line, um, unstressed and stressed. And that's the meter, right? Uh, we call that, again, that's iambic pentameter. You don't need to know specifically too much about meter, but just anticipate it. Look for it. It may be there and it may be helpful, right? Why are they stressing this particular word? Why is this line stressed? Um, or this particular part of the word, right? There's meaning that's possibly there. So you can look at that and look at that as for meaning. Uh, so that is what we're talking about when we're talking about meter and, uh, and rhythm as well. Also, when it comes to sound, we're looking at things like rhyme. Again, not all poems have rhyme, but many do. They might have internal rhyme, that's rhyme that you can find within the line, or it may have a rhyme scheme, maybe A, B, A, B, right, like a typical sonnet does. Uh, at the very end of the line is rhyming with the, not the next line, but the following line. Uh, sometimes there'll be what they call heroic couplets. These are two lines that rhyme together, uh, things like that. Again, these are all, uh, you know, possible places to look for meaning. And, and sometimes there's a reason. There might be a change in the rhyme scheme or something like that. Keep an eye out for that change in meter, change in rhythm. You may also want to look at things when we, we talk about the element of poetry, um, like alliteration or metaphors, figurative language or emphasis on sounds. Typically, authors will put the, that emphasis, those special techniques around places that may need to be highlighted or we, uh, or we can interpret them to being highlighted because of those effects. And we can notice something again. We can interpret and analyze it there. Of course, when we're analyzing poetry, now that we have sort of the elements down to an extent, uh, make sure you do the readings to get a further explanation better that I can give you here in the video. There are other things you're going to have to look for. Right? We talked about this already, this idea of the text itself. We're stuck with the words on the page. right? When we talk about Eliot, we're talking about the elements and how does the author make use of that form and how does he rebel against that form. But when we look at the sort of the ransom approach, we are stuck with just the words. So now we're, we're doing this idea of close reading. Now, a good way to sort of start practicing close reading is to look at what are they, are they call denotation and connotation. So every word has a denotation. It has a dictionary definition, right? You look up a word in the dictionary, it means this one particular thing or maybe a couple different things. However, there are also what we call connotations. Connotations are essentially the... Uh, associations that come along with a particular word. What context is that word typically used in? So now we have that combination. We have the dictionary definition, what they mean by this word in the poem, literally. But then there may also be that contextual, that connotation uh, that adds further, uh, we'll say, uh, reverberation of meaning with that particular word. So then we start to put those two together, or those multitudes of words, we can sort of start to look at the text in a different way and start to say, okay, this is what it literally means, right? And in, if you look at that close reading example, uh, poetry, where I show you uh, William Carlos Williams, this is just a say. Literally, that poem is about someone who comes along and sees plums in an icebox. The speaker then decides to eat one of those plums and writes a note about how sorry he is or she is that she ate uh, one of the plums in the icebox that the other person in the house had bought and wanted to eat. It's a very simple poem. But is it just about that? Is it about that type of thing that I ate the plums? Or is it the poem about something deeper, right? We are going to look at it face value, what it literally means like that. But when you start to analyze that poem, well, maybe it's about forgiveness and, and redemption, and it's about that sort of Adam and Eve type of curiosity, that need to know. Um, and then we can sort of put our own interpretation on top of those things. So in, in the case that you have on web study, you'll see 
I've really taken in a Adam and Eve approach to that poem. I'm saying, okay, this is supposed to be very biblical. It's supposed to be rem reminiscent of Adam and Eve. It's got this temptation and giving in to temptation vibe and all of that stuff. Uh, as I said, you can look at that on web study. I think that'll give you a better impression and better idea of what close reading physically looks like. So be sure to do your readings. Make sure to read the po all the poems. Read uh, any ancillary uh, information about poetry, the what is a poem, things like that, elements of poetry. Also read the sample poetry essay, the close reading uh, example about poetry, the academic form, those things, and the coursework if you haven't already. And be prepared to discuss your two poems in the forums come Friday. That's it for this week. Peace.